amen. It is good to be in church on Monday night. Amen. Now, that was kind of sad, too. You should, uh, you should have practiced that some after yesterday. Amen. Let's try it again. It's good to be in church on Monday night. Amen. There you go. There you go. I'm glad you feel that way. I hope you'll be here tomorrow night and Wednesday night, unless you have your own services and you're not from this church, in which case you need to be there or bring a note or something of that sort or, or sneak out. Maybe they won't notice. Amen? And unless you're the pastor, in which case they might notice. You never know. But I'm glad that you're here tonight. We do have stuff out there on the table. We have the CDs. We have USB thumb drives that have our, our three newest CDs on them, uh, as well as uh, two Christmas songs that never made it onto CDs, and then some uh, video clips. There are five video clips on the end of that, and so you just stick it into the USB thing on your, in your car or on your, your uh, DVD player or your little whatever streaming device you have. You shove that in there, and it'll pop up on the TV or on whatever it is that you watch or listen to and uh, hopefully you know how to work that. Amen? Amen? But those are back there and all the CDs. And our, don't forget the tote bags. For goodness sake, don't forget the tote bags. They're, they're red. Ooh. Ooh, thank you, thank you. And, and in bright, bright yellow letters, they say, don't call me lucky, call me blessed. Wow. Ah, yeah. And they're only $5. Amazing. Wow. Such a, such a response from the congregation. That's, that's really good. Remember to do that next time. Amen. That's, that's a blessing. But they're out there on the table, and you can get all that stuff, and prayer cards are out there. And uh, we also uh, have something that we didn't have before. Uh, a friend of mine, a pastor over in Kansas, uh, wrote a book on music and the effect that it has on your Christian life. Uh, it's a good book. It's not a, it's not a technical manual or anything like that. He just goes through the Word of God and shows you Bible principles about how it affects you and, and what kind of impact it can have on your life. Uh, if you're interested in that, we have those out on the table as well. Uh, we got a few from him because I, I think people will be interested in reading that and having that available. But all that's out on the table and, and David or Hope will be back there afterwards and they can help you and they can make change and they can do all that. We used to take you know, we take cash, we take checks, uh, we take credit cards. We used to take firstborn children, and, and then we had kids. So we don't want any more of those. And, and so uh, just cash or check, or, or you can do all kinds of magic things by touching the little thing. And, and money just comes right out of your account. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it wonderful how easy it is to spend money? All you have to do is get too close to the scanner, and there it goes. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 22. Matthew, chapter 22. They told me that this was fresh, clean water up here. Untouched by human lips. And so I'm going to take that by faith. Amen? Matthew, chapter number 22. Uh, if you found that, would you stand with me as we read the Word of God? Matthew, chapter 22, beginning in verse number 23 tonight. It says this, The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead. Have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the good day that you gave to us today. And thank you that we can be here tonight. And Lord, as we look into your word, I pray uh, that your Holy Spirit would be able to use it in our hearts and lives to make real and lasting changes. And we'll thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. You may be seated. I want to preach to you tonight on this subject, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now here, Jesus is confronted by a, a group of Sadducees. The Sadducees were a religious sect. We hear often of the Pharisees in the Bible, and, and they were one religious sect, but the Sadducees were a distinctive group. They had their own special set of doctrines, and their most distinctive doctrine was that there's no resurrection. When you die, you're dead, that's the end, kaput, nothing after that. Now, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, and the Sadducees did not. So there was some conflict there, and they didn't necessarily get along very well, except that they had a common enemy, and that was Jesus. And so sometimes you'll see the Pharisees and the Sadducees working together to try to, to trick Jesus or trap him into saying something that's not right. And in this case, the Sadducees have come, they don't believe there's a resurrection, and they've made up this story. I think they just made up the whole thing out of thin air. They said, we had seven brethren with us, and the first one married a wife, <clears throat> and then he died, and he had no children. So according to the custom of the law, he passed off that wife to the next brother, and he married her, and they had no children, and he died. And so according to the custom, he passed her off, to the third brother, and he married her, and they had no children, and he died. And so, according to the custom, he passed her off to the fourth brother, and, and here's why I think this is all made up. If you're the fourth brother, do you not see there's a pattern here? I mean, can you not look at your three older brothers and say, no, thank you? Is there a loophole where I don't have to marry? The, something's wrong with this woman. I don't know what, but something is wrong. And, and he just ignores it all, and he marries her. And you know what happens. He dies. And, and then she goes to the fifth brother. He marries her. The fifth one's not very smart at all. He marries her. He dies. The sixth one marries her. He dies. And then that last poor sap, the seventh one, he does it too. He marries her. And... and and then he dies, and then she dies, and the world is safe. Amen? Amen. Finally, finally, nobody else has to deal with this woman. And, and they said, okay, now, Jesus, here's the scenario. She was married to all seven of them, and now they're all dead. Now, remember, they don't believe there's a resurrection. They said, so in this resurrection thing, you see, Jesus talked a lot about the resurrection. He even said, I am the resurrection and the life. And, and they said, now in the resurrection that you talk about, whose wife will she be? Surely she won't have seven husbands in the resurrection. That can't be. Whose wife is she going to be? And they thought there was no answer to the question. And Jesus would be embarrassed, and all the people would walk away, and they would turn away from Jesus. But look at what he says down here in verse 29. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Now, remember, these Sadducees, they are theologians. They study, the, they study the scrolls. They study the Torah. They study all the writings of Moses. They know it all. And they think that they've even found stuff in there that God didn't know was in there. I mean, they're that good of Bible scholars. They found good stuff down there, hidden deep. And so they think they've trapped him. What they don't understand, he's the author. And they're trying to trick him with a question from the book. And so he answers the question, and he says to them, here's the first problem. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. You want to make a theologian mad, tell him he doesn't know the scriptures. Really, you can tell him almost anything else. You can slap his grandma, and you can get away with that, but you can't tell him he doesn't know the scriptures, or he'll be mad in a flash, just like that. And that's what Jesus did. I mean, he just... He went right for the heart of the thing. He said, here's your problem. You don't know the scriptures. And then once he got the knife stuck in there, then he twisted it a little bit. He said, not only do you not know the scriptures, you don't know the power of God. You don't know the scriptures, and you don't even know the God of the scriptures. Now, you want to make a theologian mad. That's the way to do it. Everybody thinks Jesus only said sweet, loving, kind things all the time. It's not sweet, loving, and kind. He's doing this on purpose. He said, you don't know the scriptures, you don't know the word of God, you don't know the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, 
but are as the angels of God in heaven. That's the answer to their question. Whose wife will she be in, in the resurrection? Nobody's. Nobody's. Jesus answered the question. Verse number 31, he answers the question they didn't ask. They never asked about if there was a resurrection or not, but he's about to tell them. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. I, I wish we could go back and watch the replay and see their faces when Jesus says this to them, because you know they get mad as soon as he says, you don't know the scriptures nor the power of God. And then he gives them the answer, and they're just fuming because they should have known the answer. And then he says, by the way, didn't you read where God said, back in Exodus chapter 3, when he's talking to Moses at the burning bush, and he said, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, and our God is not the God of the dead. There, there were gods that were gods of the dead that were worshipped. That's even true today. That's not our God. Our God is the God of the living because the truth is with our God, there really is no death. If you know our God, you just step from this life into the presence of God and eternal life in heaven. There's no, there's no death with our God. He's the God of the living. Notice he used three guys, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to prove that God's the God of the living. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had already been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years. But they were as alive, more alive than they had ever been because they were with God. Amen? Amen. Just like the child of God that, that dies today, we say they died. What we mean is their body stopped working. And they immediately, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, and all of a sudden, they're more alive now than they ever were, and they were running around down here in the dirt. Amen? Far more alive. Our God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Notice, when he said that, he identified God by three people. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are lots of names for God in your Bible. Lots of names. Some that have to do with different characteristics and attributes. And some just like God is love. He's the God of peace. On and on. Different defining things about who God is. And there are names of God. You've probably seen those posters made up of just the names of God. And it covers a huge sheet. This is the only one where God uses people as the identifiers to tell us who he is. He said, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now you'll see it also later on in the Bible. I'm the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Israel, but Israel and Jacob are the same person. You understand that, right? And so you'll see this all through the word of God, and he uses those three to tell us who he is. So I believe it's significant since that's the only name for God like that. So we're just going to look at that tonight. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, when, when you think of Abraham, you see, we, we talked about Jonah last night, and I reminded you that it's important to know about Jonah. And, and the, the little book of Jonah is not really about Jonah, and it's not really about the Ninevites. The little book of Jonah is about God. It is. It's to teach you some things about who God is. When God gives us this name for himself, he's not just saying you need to know who Abraham is and you need to know who Isaac is. He's saying you need to know who I am. And if you see how I worked with them, you'll know a little bit more about me. So here he says, I'm the God of Abraham. When you think of Abraham, don't you think of the promises of God? I mean, when, when God and Abraham first have interaction... God comes to Abraham and he starts making promises. He says, if you'll get up from here and go that direction, turn to, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 12, if you would. Genesis chapter 12. Verse number one. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, 
and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. All the promises of God to Abraham that are going to come after this, they're all going to build on this foundation. They'll add to that. They'll explain that. They'll define some of the things going on. But this is, the, this is the seed. This is the root of all the promises of God to Abraham. And by the way, the promises of God to Abraham are still good. He did not revoke them. Notice he says here in verse number one, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. What is he saying to Abraham there in verse one? He's saying, Abraham, you can trust me. You just get up from here and you head that direction. I, I'm not telling you right now where you're going. You just trust me and I'll get you there. And Abraham is going to go that way. Amen. In, in, in the middle of all that, he's implying that he's going to take care of Abraham, is he not? So you got to get up, you got to walk away from all this stuff that you have and all this stuff that you know. From every indication, Abraham is a wealthy man. He really is. And he continues to be a wealthy man on through his life. And even after he gets to Canaan and all the rest, God blesses him. His goods and herds and everything are greatly increased. Can you imagine getting up from a, a wealthy life and, a, and an established situation and just heading out across the desert? That's what God told Abraham to do. He said, I just want you to get up and go. And he was saying, Abraham, I'll provide for you. In verse 2, he said, I will make of thee a great nation. Abraham had no children. Now, again, the implication is, if you'll get up and follow me in the direction I'm going to lead you, I'm going to give you children. As a matter of fact, if God's going to make of him a great nation, he has to give him children. He's got to have at least one, or there will be no nation. There will be no descendants. And so buried in the middle of all this is that wonderful promise, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to intervene in your life. And I'm going to do something you can't do that you haven't been able to do. In verse number two, he said, I will bless thee and make thy name great. He said, Abraham, when you head off that direction, I'm going to make of you a great nation and I'm going to give you a good reputation. I'm going to make your name great. When they talk about Abraham, they'll speak highly of Abraham. If you go read through this, this uh, narrative of Abraham's life, you'll find out when he gets to the land of Canaan that he is well-known and well-respected. As a matter of fact, when trouble comes and an invading army is coming and some of those little city-states are in trouble, they run to Abraham and they say, help, somebody's, they're coming after us. And, and Abraham arms all of his herdsmen and all of his men and they go in and fight off the enemies and deliver the land. God gave him a good reputation. He said, and thou shalt be a blessing. God used Abraham to be a blessing to the people in the land of Canaan. He really did. Did you know that sometimes God blesses you not just to dump things on you so you can have things, but he blesses you so that you can then be a blessing to someone else. And that just passes on and on and on. And not everything that God gives us is just so we'll have more stuff. A lot of times, he's blessing us so that we can then be a blessing to other people. The truth is, your church sitting here on the side of the highway in Norwalk, Ohio, is a blessing to those around you. They may not know that. They may not even believe that. But it is. It really is. You're a good influence in the community and in the area, and they're better off because you're here. They are. Listen, that will be borne out after the rapture when we're all gone and all of a sudden all manner of havoc breaks out in the world. All of a sudden people will realize that it was a benefit to have God's people here. It really was. They may not know it or understand it, but we're a blessing to those around us. And then he said in verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. He said that when you get over there, the ones, that are, the ones that are kind to you and help you, and I'm going to bless them. And the ones that curse you, I'm going to curse them. God has never revoked any of those promises. That's why it's important how we treat the little nation of Israel. It is. 
It's important how we treat them because God said, if you treat Abraham well, I will bless you. And if you don't, I will curse you. And we don't need that. Amen. We got enough problems without having a curse from God on us. Amen? Yeah, amen. You understand that during the last uh, presidential administration, we were able to facilitate some treaties between Israel and some of the little Islamic nations around them. They called them, interestingly enough, the Abraham Accords. Uh, as a matter of fact, when, when the previous president left office, they, they were ready to have Saudi Arabia sign on to the whole thing. Now, none of them said, we love Israel and we support Israel. That's not what it said. What it said was, we acknowledge that Israel has a right to exist and we're not going to try to destroy them. We said, well, that's not very good. Oh, that's wonderful. That's a whole lot better than what they've been saying forever. What they've been saying forever is we're going to wipe them out and push them in the sea. So when they signed on the dotted line and said, we're going to acknowledge they have a right to exist and we're not going to try to destroy them and we might even trade with them a little bit. That was huge. It was a huge deal. You know what? All of, all of those little nations that signed on to that, you know what God will do with them if they keep their word? He will bless them. I mean those little backwater, good-for-nothing, little Islamic places that you don't even know where they are, that hate you and hate God and hate everything. You know what God will do? He will bless them if they just be nice to Israel. He really will. And they'll have better lives than they have ever had. And those that turn against Israel like we saw this last fall, God's going to curse them. And they're not going to do well, and they shouldn't do well. Amen? Amen. We should have got a couple more amens out of that. God's going to curse them. They won't do well, and they should not do well. Amen. Amen. Because God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. When you think of Abraham, you think of the promises of God. He said, I'm the God of Abraham. Here's the, here's the good news. All the promises of God are still good. And every promise God made to you in that book is still good. Amen. Amen. When I was a little kid in Sunday school, we used to sing a song. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. Now, to be perfectly honest, that's not exactly doctrinally true. Because there are promises in there that are not to me. There are promises in there to specific people, specific places, but every promise in there that applies to me, I can claim that and build my life on it. Amen. It's valid and it won't go away because our God, the God of promise, always keeps his promises. Amen. He said, I'm the God of Abraham. We see the promises of God. He said, I'm the God of Isaac. Isaac's a little different. You see, Isaac really in the book of Genesis is almost a a transitional character because Abraham gets a lot of space in your Bible. He's from the beginning all the way to the end. Abraham keeps getting mentioned. There's a lot of, a lot of ink on Abraham here and a lot of pages covered on Abraham's life. There's a lot on Jacob. He's from the beginning all the way through the end. Isaac just comes in between and his story just takes up a few little pages in your Bible. And most of what we know about Isaac either has to do with Abraham or Jacob. It really does. So he's really kind of a transitional character, and yet God said, here's how you know who I am. I'm the God of Abraham, and I am the God of Isaac. When you see Abraham, you see the promises of God. When you see Isaac, you see the provision of God. You see, God made promises to Abraham. He said, I'm going to make of you a great nation, and you know the story. When he told Abraham, he said, Abraham, you and Sarah are going to have a child. And Sarah laughed. And Abraham laughed. And they said, no, that's not, it can't happen. It's not going to work. Look at Genesis chapter 21, verse number 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. You know what Isaac was? Isaac was the provision of God 
to fulfill the promise he made all the way back there in chapter 12. Isaac starts his life as the provision of God. That's who Isaac is. And then God says to Abraham, I want you to take your only son Isaac and go up on Mount Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering unto God. And God, or Abraham gets Isaac and they start going up the mountain. And Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide himself a lamb. And they get up there and he lays Isaac out on that altar and he's ready to take that knife and plunge it into his son and sacrifice his son. And the angel of the Lord says, whoop, stop. Stop right there. He said, don't do it. He said, now I know that you believe me and you're going to serve me. And there's a ram caught in the thicket over there. You know what that was? The provision of God. Amen. Isaac's life is just the provision of God all over the place. He said, well, well, Abraham wouldn't really have sacrificed Isaac. I mean, that would be awful. According to the Bible, he was going to do it. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, it says, Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. You know what he's saying? I believe the promise of God, and this is the promise of God, and that means if God wants me to take his life, God will raise him from the dead. That's what Abraham was thinking, it tells us over in Hebrews. He just believed that God would keep his promise no matter what. And he will. Amen? Amen. And God provides. After Isaac grows up, gets married, they don't have any children. And so he intercedes for his wife and he prays that God would allow Rebekah to have a child. Now, it's not just a matter of they wanted a child and they didn't have one. You see, if, if Rebecca doesn't have a child, if Isaac doesn't have a child, then the promise to Abraham is no good because it dies right there. God said, I will make of you a great nation. So Isaac has to have some descendants. And so he intercedes, and sure enough, God provides. And he doesn't just give them one, he gives them two. And they may have regretted that later, but they got two. They got Jacob and Esau, or Esau and Jacob. Esau was first, amen? And they got two. And, and sure enough, there was the provision of God. And then strife started, and things started to go south. But you see, all through Isaac's life, God provides. When Abraham dies, before he dies, he disperses his goods. He, he takes care of all of his servants. He takes care of everybody in his employ, or everybody. And then the Bible says, and all of Abraham's wealth went to Isaac. Isaac didn't earn it. Isaac, uh, Isaac didn't work for it. All Isaac did to get all of that wealth and all that provision for the rest of his life, you know what he did to get that? He just got born into the right family, that's all. That's all he did. And all of a sudden, here's all the wealth of Abraham, and he's provided for for the rest of his life. Kind of like when a lost sinner gets saved. You don't deserve it. You couldn't earn it if your life depended on it. All you got to do is get born into the right family. And now all the promises of God are yours. Amen? Now all that wonderful stuff God says about what you can have and what you can do and what you can look forward to, now it belongs to you. Just because you got born into the right family. Provision of God. When you see Abraham, you see the promises of God. When you see Isaac, you see the provision of God. And, and I'm looking around out here, and I, I see you. And, and I would say that I can say very confidently tonight that God has provided for you. I know that to be true because you're here. Amen. I know God's provided for us. And sometimes you don't know how that's going to take shape. During 2020, you know, the whole world shut down and, and we were stuck at home. We were, we were stuck at the house for 10 weeks from the end of whatever it was, May, was it May? March until the middle of June. And then boom, we took off again and all was well. But there we were, 10 weeks at the house. That's a long time. We had never been at the house for more than a week ever. Really, we had never been there for more than a week we're, we're in a different place every week of the year. And all of a sudden, to be there for 10 weeks in a row, we planted tomatoes just for fun. We planted some other stuff just to see if it would grow just for fun. 
I bought a lawnmower. I've never owned a lawnmower in all my life till 2020. The church next door mows our lawn because we're not there. And so I said to Liz, I'm going to buy a lawnmower. We're home. Who knows how long we're going to be home? I mean, after all, we got 15 days to flatten the curve. I got 15 days to be home. I can mow the lawn. Somebody lied about that, by the way. And, and so I went and got me a lawnmower from Home Depot, and I'm out there mowing the lawn. And I, I, didn't, I didn't get one of them riding mowers. No, 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 no. I didn't get one of them self-powered ones that you just walk behind and it just pulls itself. No, no. I got the kind you got to push. I wanted exercise while I'm mowing the lawn. A few months ago, I bought a riding mower, but that's all I'm going to say. I wanted a tractor. That's what I wanted it just happens to mow the lawn, that's all. I, I was out there mowing. Liz wanted to take a turn. She took a turn. She's going across the yard. David wanted to take a turn. Can you imagine a teenage boy wanting to take a turn mowing the lawn? <laughs> Hope wanted to take a turn. They all took a turn. Now, the next time I mowed, nobody wanted to take a turn. But <laughs> the first time, first time they did. <laughs> so, you know, you, you enjoy it while you can. And that was good. But we were stuck home for, for 10 weeks. Liz said, uh, should I get a job at Walmart? Because that was an essential business. You couldn't close that down. You, could, you, know, you couldn't go to the dentist, but you could go to Walmart and the liquor store. I guess it all depends on who makes the rules, amen, as to what's essential and what's not. And, and I said, no, let's just, let's just wait and see what happens. Now, I'll just be honest with you. What, what we do, what we're doing this week, this is our livelihood. And we live on love offerings, and that's, that's our livelihood. So if we're not out doing what we do for 10 weeks, that means we go without a paycheck for 10 weeks. That's a long time to go without a paycheck. And, and the, the upside of that is this is also the most expensive thing that we do. Buying gas and driving, and uh, that's expensive. So if we're not driving and going place to place and having to eat out and this and that, our expenses go way down, but you still got expenses. And you know what happened during that time? God provided. Amen. He did. He provided. We had all those, all those revival meetings. They all canceled. And some of those places, not all of them, but some of those where we had meetings scheduled, that you know what they did? They sent love offerings anyway. They, they really did. They sent a check in the mail, said, we know you couldn't be with us, and, and, and all the rest here is, hopefully this will help. There were places that we were not scheduled to be that, that took up a special offering for us on a Wednesday night or something and sent us a check. A church in Michigan sent us a check for $200, and another one sent a check for $200, and they just took up an offering because they knew we weren't traveling, and they knew that that's our livelihood, and they just wanted to be a blessing. People got on our website and donated. People that I don't know. I don't know where they go to church. I don't know who they are. They just donated, and they'd leave a little note saying, I hope this will be a, a help, a blessing. And then churches said, we'd like to do an online service for us. We'd go out in my office. We'd sing to the phone. I'd turn around and preach to the phone, and we'd send it off to them. And we only did it because we didn't have anything else to do. Not one time did we ever send a letter saying, help, we don't have any livelihood. Please send. Not one time. Not once. Never. But we, when they said, would you do an online thing? I never said, yes, and it'll be X number of dollars or if you send us an offering. Never said that. We just didn't have anything else to do. Might as well do it. Amen? Amen. And we did it. And you know what they did? They sent love offerings. Our home church sent us a letter, uh, an email. that said, we just deposited X number of dollars in your account because we know you're not traveling and, and we know it's going to be rough and hope this will help. And you know what God did for those 10 weeks? He took care of everything that we could possibly need. Amen. He really did. He provided. And I suspect he provided for you too. So, well, well I, I worked at Walmart and I had to work the whole time. That was the provision of God. I mean, if you got to go back to work and be that, that was God providing for you. But for some people, it dropped out of the sky. For others, they got to go work for it. And listen, God can use all kinds of stuff to provide. But he always provides for his children. He does. When you see the, the, the words, I'm the God of Abraham, you think of God's promises. 
when you see the words, I'm the God of Isaac, you think of the provision of God. And then it says, and the God of Jacob. Jacob's a little different. Jacob has a rough start. Jacob, well, quite honestly, Jacob's not a nice person. He's not. Jacob, Jacob is a mess. He's dishonest. He's cowardly. He, he feels led of God to move a lot at night when nobody's looking. You know, kind of you hear about people that move every month when the rent is due. That's Jacob. That's, that's him. When trouble comes, he runs. That's what he does. He's, I like to call him a weasel because that's what he is. His name means supplanter. In, in good old American terminology, that's a weasel. Amen? That's a weasel. And that's who he is, and it's what he does. In chapter 24, he tricks his older brother Esau out of the birthright. And things go downhill from there. Uh, and, and, and then in chapter 27 of Genesis, with the help of his mother, no less, he steals the blessing that Esau was supposed to get as the oldest son. Jacob steals that blessing, and, and now things have gotten so ugly at the house that Esau says to Jacob, now I'm going to kill you. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill you. And so Jacob, or uh, Isaac and Rebekah said, Jacob, you better get out of here. And he feels led of God to move in the night and he takes off and he runs go to Genesis chapter 28 in the midst of all of Jacob's running he stops and in Genesis chapter 28 look at verse 11 it says and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took the took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. Do you see some things missing there? That's because he's not yet the God of Jacob. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac, but not Jacob yet. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And he reminds Jacob of all the promises he gave to Abraham and Isaac. And look, if he would, down at place number 19. Verse number 19. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. He's still a weasel. Do you see what he's doing here? God says, Jacob, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac, and you can have all these promises that I gave to them. And Jacob's response was, okay, if you'll give me this and this and this and this and this, I'll let you be my God. That, that, that kind of bargaining. You come to God and say, I have nothing worthwhile at all. Please just give me what you can give me. I deserve destruction. That's how you come to God. That's how you came to God then. That's how you come to God now. You don't come to God as a lost sinner telling him what you want from him. You come to him telling him you have nothing to offer and you need the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And so Jacob is still a weasel. He goes on and he goes to Laban's house and there he marries Leah and there he marries Rachel and, and he starts to have children and, and his flocks are increasing. And then one day Laban, his father-in-law, seems to notice that Jacob's herds are increasing and his herds are decreasing and Jacob's in charge of all of them. And Laban thinks something's fishy and it is a little fishy. And so Jacob, realizing things are getting a little hot, he decides, well, the Lord is leading him to move in the night. <laughs> and so he gathers up all of his people and all of his stuff and a few things that don't belong to him, and they take off in the middle of the night. And his father-in-law is angry. And so his father-in-law now is in hot pursuit. Jacob and his whole crew, they're, they're headed out. Laban is chasing him and finally catches him, and it, it's ugly. And, and then Laban goes back home, and Jacob is stuck there out in the desert. 
But when he ran away from Laban, he was running back toward where he came from, back there at Isaac's house, where Esau is, where Esau said, I'm going to kill you. And then word comes that Esau and a whole band of men are coming this way. Now, what do you suppose Jacob thought? <laughs> he thought, they are coming to kill me. They're going to kill me, and they're going to wipe out my family, and they're going to take all my stuff, and there he is, just a sitting duck, just waiting. And so Jacob, being the strong, noble, godly leader that he is, sends the women and children ahead and goes back on the other side of the creek. I told you, he is a weasel. He is a worthless weasel. And there he is. Turn to, turn to chapter 32, if you would. Chapter number 32, Jacob has another visit from God. Verse 24, and Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Do you see any difference in this encounter with God than in the last encounter with God? In the last one, he sees God and he says, I want this and this and this and this. In this one, he meets God, and he's hanging on for dear life, and he says, just bless me. You just give me what, what you need, what I need. And God says, all right, I'll accept you on those terms. Don't give me a list of stuff I have to do. I'll just accept you because you need me. And now your name is Israel instead of Jacob. Now you're not the supplanter and the trickster and the weasel. Now you're a prince with God and men. Now, after this point, I'd like to tell you that from this point on, Jacob is perfect. I mean, he has no problems. He's, he's just straight as an arrow and all is well. But uh, a wise man once said, an idiot who gets saved is just a saved idiot. Amen. And there's still some of that back there. <laughs> and he does some stupid stuff after he gets right with God. He does. The difference is, now every time he does something really stupid, he comes back to following God. Instead of running away and blaming someone else, now he comes back to following God every time without exception. He's a different man now. He really is. He said, well, well, what do you think of with Jacob? With Abraham, you see the promises of God. With Isaac, you see the provision of God. What in the world do you see with Jacob other than just a mess? What you see with Jacob is the possibilities with God. You see, Jacob, Jacob is nothing but a possibility. At the beginning, he's, he's a disaster. He's a mess. There's nothing of value there. And we all would have given up on Jacob much earlier we really would have. I mean, after the whole birthright thing and then, the, and then the blessing thing, we probably would have kicked him down the road and said, just don't ever come back and stay away and hopefully Esau will find you and kill you somewhere along the line. But that's not what God did. Instead, God meets with him in chapter 28. Then he meets with him again in chapter 32 when he's all alone and there's nobody to blame and nowhere to run. And finally... Jacob has to get right with God. And then Jacob, Jacob is in that wonderful line. When they go into Egypt and they stay there for 400 years because of the famine and, and Joseph, of course, is in charge of administrating it, gives them the land of Goshen to live in. And down there in the land of Goshen, they go from being a family to a nation. And then Moses can come along 400 years later and bring them out and take them back across to the land that God has promised to them. And in that land, ultimately, one day, wonderful things are going to happen. David is going to become king. 
and through his lineage is going to be a little girl by the name of Mary who shows up one day. And after years and years and centuries of waiting for a Messiah, an angel's going to show up and say to Mary, you're the one and he's coming. And Jesus is coming into the world through that messed up family like we talked about Sunday morning. I mean, come on. It's a mess. And Jesus is coming through that family. And I promise you, as God is talking to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis and saying, I'm going to make of you a great nation, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You know who he's talking about? He's talking about you. And you, and you, and me. And as he's, and he's, he's talking to Abraham, he already sees there's an Isaac, and there's a Jacob, and there's a Moses, and there's, and there's a David, and there's a Mary, and Joseph, and there's Jesus. And God is already planning the redemption of your soul as he's making promises to Abraham. Isn't that amazing? And he's thinking of you. And it all hangs on one weasel in the middle who has to get right with God. Because if he didn't get right with God, the whole thing falls apart. It really does. And finally, God, listen, here's what you need to know. Don't give up on people before God does. God didn't give up on Jacob. He just kept coming back until finally Jacob had to get right. And now he can be in that line that stretches all the way through. What a wonderful God. He's the God of promise. He's the God of provision. But he's also the God of possibilities. And you ought to be thankful for that. Because if he were not the God of possibilities, some of us would not be here tonight. And I don't just mean we wouldn't be in church. I mean we'd already be dead. But God is patient and long And God knows what we could be if we would just surrender. And he's willing to wait a little while and give us a chance and another chance and another chance for us to one day finally say, okay, all right, I'm done. I give up. And then amazing things can happen. He's the God of possibility. You might, you might know a Jacob. You might have one in your family. You might have one at work. You might know one at school. You might know one. Most of us know one or two or several. Don't give up on them yet. God's not done. It's not over. If they're still breathing, it's not over yet. It's not over. They, they could be out there a mess tonight, and a year from now they could be sitting right here with a Bible in their hand. You don't know. All it takes is that moment where they can't run away from God anymore, and they have to come face to face with Him, and they have to own up to what they are, and they can get right with God. It would be a wonderful thing. Maybe you're one. Well, then I would encourage you to get right with God. Amen? It might be that God put you here tonight so he could get you right in the eyeball and say, this is the time. Amen? Quit messing around. Get right with God. And everything can change. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we could be here tonight. Lord, thank you for giving us this wonderful insight into who you are by letting us know that you were the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. We're thankful for the promises. We marvel at the provision. And Lord, we stand in awe of the fact that you are still God of possibility. Lord, maybe there's somebody here tonight who doesn't know Christ. Maybe they've been fighting and pushing. Tonight would be a good night to give up and get saved. Maybe somebody who is saved has been fighting against what you want them to do. Lord, I pray tonight they'd just surrender. And Lord, maybe tonight there's somebody who's got a Jacob on their heart. They just need to pray for them and not give up. We'll ask you to work in our midst and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, Brother Rogers is going to play a song of invitation. And that is definitely a message you want to respond to. And that, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to think right now, Think of some promises that you've read about in the scripture and he's brought that to pass in your life. Man, God provided that just like he said he would. Think about some of the provision. He talked about COVID and other things and how God has provided for you and you knew it was him. 
There's no other way to explain it, but God provided that. And I also want you to think of what the possibilities of what God could do with you. Now, let me tell you this. It is all God that gives the promises. He is faithful to keep those promises. It is God that gives the provision as only he can. And God will bring about those possibilities. However, this is the first action you see where we get a part in it. In other words, if my people, which are called by my name, the ifs of life, if we just surrender, if we would just listen, if we would just be faithful, if we would just surrender our lives, what could God do? Is there anything too hard for God? No. As they sang that song, do you think about that? You think about Daniel, what he thought as he was trusting in God. And there are many times where you say to yourself, well, you know, why do we put these, ourselves in these positions? You know, I'm not gonna just throw myself there. I'm gonna trust God, but why put myself? Remember what Daniel did? The decree was put out. What did he do? He opened the doors. And he prayed just like before, but now he was, he didn't care. In other words, he was taking a stand for God. And as he was in that lion's den, you think he looked at those lions and thought about the provision of God, the promises of God, and the possibilities? I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what you're dealing with. But a God who has given and has precious promises does. The God who has always provided for you does. And the God who holds all the possibilities in his hands does. So would you come to him tonight as the piano plays, altars open this evening.